Hello. Welcome, Hello. Man, ladies, all the way from France. Thank Welcome you. to Santa Fe. Thank you. Hello, my beautiful co creators. Leo here on the Juicy Living Tour, going across the US. And today I have amazing, wonderful Dr. Larry Dosse with me. Actually, he's welcoming us in his home here in Santa Fe, New Mexico. What a delight to be with you in person this time and not over webcam. And exactly. Well, welcome. It's great to have you. you. Thank you. Such a wonderful energy in this place. Great. I feel the same. That's why we're here. Yeah. Yeah. Very, very special. Um, Dr. Larry Dosse has written many, many books, 11 books, actually. This is one of his latest one, The Power of Premonition, which was the topic of the latest interview. Mm -hmm. You're a, a former physician. You're an author, a consultant. And mm -hmm. um, tell us what is your main interest in your work? What is what is what is your your passion? What what is your juice in life? What are you looking? <laughs> what are you going for? <laughs> my my juice uh, has not changed very much since my earliest uh, involvement in medicine. I have always been interested in the role of consciousness in health, uh, and the role of spirituality and health and healing and staying well. When I was in medical training, that was a taboo topic. Yeah. It was all the body. And in many areas uh, in the West, it obviously is still the area that most people are interested in. But uh, bodily function is only one aspect of who we are. And if we neglect spirituality and consciousness, we just simply have an inadequate uh, approach to health and healing. Uh, and the role of spirituality goes even beyond the role of consciousness because I think we've been almost hypnotized in the Western world to think that when our body dies, that's the end of everything. Uh, it's the annihilation not just of the body, but of our personality and our consciousness. And I think that's a false view. I think it's a view that we are agonizing through and will eventually transcend and I think we're in part of that process right now so when we talk about transformation and where we're going uh, I think we're going to a pretty magnificent place we're going to a place where we recognize the majesty of consciousness and its immortality and I think we should be bold about this because the level of evidence these days is just simply in my judgment overwhelming that it isn't over simply with the death of the brain and the body Mm. That must be disturbing. Though. That must have been disturbing, though, in the scientific environment that you you came up with that. How did the people around you and other scientists uh, react to it? Well, there was no conversation, let's say, 30 or 40 years ago about this topic. Yeah. Uh, I have on file many letters of physicians who were dismissed from the hospital staff because they would make a public issue of this. Or, mm. for example, they they would pray with their patients. And this was reason to dismiss them mm. as horrible scientists and dishonest doctors. They were perpetrating superstition, this sort of thing. I, I think those old days uh, are behind us. Uh, now, uh, most of the medical schools in the United States, just as an example, have courses exploring the role of spirituality and health. Mm -hmm. uh, this is a landmark dis uh, development in Western medicine in my judgment. It is the case that you cannot become an MD, a licensed physician in this country now, without knowing how to take a spiritual history from a patient. This is a recognition that spirituality plays a major role in health, just like cholesterol and blood pressure and smoking and so on. Mm. So times have dramatically changed. So how does the science, scientific world define spirituality? Uh, I have a private personal definition. I, uh, I simply think that spirituality is a sense of connectedness with something greater than the individual self. Uh, whatever term we apply to that, whether it's God or Goddess or Allah or something with a capital S, mm -hmm. uh, there are many ways to define spirituality. But I think the common thread in all of the wisdom traditions is that there's something greater, something transcendent, that's eternal and immortal that we're part of. Mm -hmm. As a matter of fact, if I may make a, a, a shameless advertisement, I'm writing a book now exploring this idea yeah. that all individual minds are part of a larger mind, a transcendent mind, uh, and that we return uh, 
with physical death to our place in what I call the one mind. This is gone, it's an action idea. Our ancestors used to refer to this as the universal mind. Uh -huh. One of my heroes uh, in science is the uh, Austrian physicist Erwin Schrodinger, who won a Nobel Prize in physics in 1933. He was convinced that there is only one mind and that individual minds are just a, just a part of this overarching, fundamental, uh, transcendental consciousness. So I think if Schrodinger came out in favor of the one mind, we might uh, take a serious look at the possibility. And so that's, that's my current interest yeah. at the How moment. How come we forgot that we were one mind? <laughs> How did we forget that? Well, we, uh, it's even worse than that. We, we not only forgot about the one mind, we forgot about our own minds. Uh, in the, for most of the 20th century, the doctrine of materialism dominated all dialogue in neurology, uh, uh, neurological science, and so on. And materialism has it that when we use terms like mind and consciousness, that's just brain in disguise. Mm -hmm. When you really get down to it, our consciousness and thoughts and feelings are nothing more than neurotransmitters and receptor sites and just brain chemistry. So that's how we forgot our own minds, our own consciousness. Here's the problem. We now know that consciousness can do things brains can't do. This is a simple-minded way of saying that brain and consciousness cannot possibly be the same thing. Mm. Uh, I happen to follow the idea that's been quite popular uh, for most of the 20th century in uh, certain circles that uh, consciousness works through the brain, but it's not the same thing as the brain. Much like a television signal works through the television set, but the characters on the screen aren't produced by the television set. There's something beyond that. Mm -hmm. uh, I love how Mario uh, Beauregard, that is in neuroscience. Ah, yes, Costa de Beauregard, yes. Yeah, wrote this book, and I, I had the, the chance to interview him on a, did God created the brain, or did we create the brain? <laughs> well, I would have loved to have sat in on that conversation. Yeah. Uh, uh, he has been very bold in, in coming forth with the idea that consciousness is more than the brain, it can act remotely, not just in space, but in time as well. Mm -hmm. I don't think this gained him a lot of friends in physics in France, but he was speaking, I think, on the basis of compelling evidence. I think he's right, and uh, uh, that's, in my judgment, the direction that our ideas of consciousness will be going uh, in the future. I think there's no turning back. You and I discussed some reasons for this in a previous interview we had, about premonitions, yeah. right? How people can know things before they happen, how information may come from the future into the present, making possible premonitions, and so on. This is just one line of evidence that we'll never understand consciousness and how it manifests in the world if we just obsessively focus on the brain. Uh, we want to know more about the brain. Who doesn't? Mm -hmm. But that's only part of the story of who we are. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. So where do you think, the, the, the what is the future of medicine? Then? Well, the future of medicine is going to be a, a roller coaster ride, uh -huh. I think. Uh, of course, uh, I take it for granted that the technology of medicine will increase in terms of genomics and transplant surgery and on and on, mm -hmm. with medications becoming more and more personalized and specific and hopefully more effective. All that's taken for granted. But what we're seeing entering medicine now uh, is more than just uh, high-tech approaches to health care. Uh, there's a growing awareness that consciousness has to be part of the equations of health. And uh, I think that that's where the most exciting developments are. There's still a lot of resistance to this. There's still a lot of, uh, there's still a lot of people who want to equate consciousness with the brain. Every week or so, someone comes out with a new book saying that near-death experiences, precognition, uh, children who remember previous lives, all of this sort of thing is just nonsense. Uh, so that point of view is still alive and well, but it's a dying heartbeat. There's not 
there is no chance that materialism equating consciousness with the brain can carry the day. And I think that the resistance is just the dying throes of an old paradigm that is uh, in the process of dying. Mm -hmm. uh, is, is, is what is happening right now in Texas part of that dying of one paradigm, you think? Well, uh, I think there's evidence all over the place that uh, it is dying. And uh, if you follow the debates about consciousness and some of the strange ways consciousness manifests, such as with precognition, as you and I have talked about before, you will see the debates often term, ter, turning very vehement and, and angry. And I think that uh, this is predictable because when people see that their ideology and how they define themselves is being threatened, the tendency is to lash out and to become bitter. Mm -hmm. And so some of the bitterness in this debate, I think, is owing to that fact that the proponents of the old view see it dying and inevitably uh, are not very happy about that. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. And unfortunately, there's, there, there's the old that needs to come up and some, yeah, some anger. And, and so what's new? What's ahead of us? How, how can we um, be part of that and open ourselves up to new ways of thinking? How can we ourselves participate in new discoveries in, mm -hmm. you know, in our life? In the, even if we're not scientists, there is a way to contribute to that, sure. isn't there? You know, I think the starting this place... This mind. <laughs> <laughs> yes. Well, I think one of the healthy starting places about how we can become part of this movement, this transformation, and add to it, uh, and be open toward the new evidence, is simply to begin with a sense of humility. Uh, we really, I believe, have great difficulty with their neurological makeup of assimilating some of these ideas. Uh, the universe is a very complicated place. I think we only see just a sliver of what is really going on. And uh, there's a saying from the, the 20th century uh, and the 30s that captures my attitude toward the humility that's required. Uh, Sir Arthur Eddington, the great uh, British astronomer physicist said once, uh, something unknown is doing we don't know what. And for me, this is just a very humble admission that there is much mystery in the world. And I honor that. And I think that's the beginning point for going forward. Uh, there are things that we are not aware of. There are things that we may not be able to understand. Uh, but we do the best we can. The worst thing is just to adopt a narrow view and exclude everything on the basis that it just doesn't suit us. You know, this is just simply nothing more than ideology and prejudice and bias and bigotry. And those things are alive and well in science. They always have been. And we always have to struggle against confining ourselves to our own biases and narrowness. Uh, for me, that's a constant struggle. And I think that's true for everyone. Uh, we're always uh, caught between two poles. We want to be comfortable in our belief systems. And that sometimes tends to make us blind to emerging evidence that doesn't fit. Mm -hmm. and, but we have to do the best we can. And I think that uh, the best uh, starting point, as I say, for that openness is just a, simply a, a sense of humility. Yeah, and would you say that this openness is the openness of the heart? What would you say the heart uh, role in all of this? Well, for me, following the heart uh, is the essence of uh, intuition and creativity and, and openness. Uh, I see uh, skeptics and cynics almost shut down their hearts in reaction to some of the emerging evidence. That's lethal. I think that's uh, the beginning of being a traitor to science. The uh, proper approach is to be open to any sort of evidence that presents itself, no matter how uncomfortable it may make us. If we're to deal with that, we have to have an open heart. Uh, if we don't, then uh, we just simply, I think, uh, might as well be uh, unconscious computers, processes, processors of just raw data. Yeah. Uh, the heart is absolutely crucial. 
If you read uh, some of the writings that have been left by some of the great physicists uh, of the 20th century, uh, they're profoundly mystical. They are heart-centered and heart-oriented. And without uh, factors of love and compassion and profound caring for science itself and for the world we operate in, we're going to make a mess of things. And we're going to come up with a science that is heartless and is not fit to be visited upon human beings and upon the planet. Mm. There seems to be a certain wisdom that comes with an open heart, or a certain uh, expansion and, and tapping into this one mind. Oh, absolutely. You know, some of the uh, most spiritual people I know currently working, uh, or people working in these domains of consciousness, where consciousness is being re revisioned and uh, revised, uh, these people are extraordinarily open. I do not know any of them who do not have a rich spiritual life. Uh, uh, you know, 50 years ago, this was not done. Uh, the word spirituality was equated with uh, occultism and so on. Uh, and this is another area, I think, where we're, we're going forward. We're saying that if you want to be a good scientist, you have to have not just a good head, but a good heart, too. Uh, the two are absolutely uh, uh, essential. Mm. Mm. So what are the things, so you're working on this book now, The One Mind? Well, I, uh, I, I'm sort of a roving troublemaker uh, <laughs> yeah. in my profession. I, are you? I, I happen to say that, uh, and I'm grateful for this, I had the opportunity to uh, talk to uh, medical schools and universities around the country uh, yeah. about these ideas. Uh, and uh, that's an essential part of my my work, trying to present a side to students and young learners, young scientists about information they should pay attention to. Mm -hmm. And uh, I was uh, recently at Columbia University uh, in the United States, one of our major uh, schools, talking about, of all things, if you can imagine this, immortality and the infinite aspects of consciousness. Uh, I love doing this, you know. I always think that, well, I'll never be invited back, you know. Uh, <laughs> nobody will show up for the lectures. <laughs> but it almost always happens the exact opposite. Yeah. For example, after the Columbia lecture uh, uh, with uh, some more of my colleagues who speak about these things, the students uh, demanded a uh, permanent lecture series that would focus on these ideas, which they told us they do not get from their professors. Right. And so it was a standing room only uh, uh, event, and I thought, these kids get it, you know. Yeah. Their hearts are much more open than I think mine yeah, was. When, resistance. Yes. With the new generation in yeah. there. I think one reason that there's increasing openness, particularly in medicine, towards the ideas of consciousness and spirituality is because of the huge influx of women into the profession. Oh, yeah. Now, 50% or more of medical school classes in the United States are made up of women. And I think this has had a, an effect of helping open the heart of medicine in, in, in this country. Mm. So how do you approach immortality when you're at Columbia University? Or, you know, how, do you, how do you start? How oh. do you get them into this topic? <laughs> yeah. Well, first of all, I uh, simply tell them that I'm not here to, uh, to inflict my personal views on anyone. Uh, so I just simply take a backed-off objective approach, and I tell them about studies that consciousness in this situation behaves like this. So I ask them, look, what picture of consciousness must you uh, adopt in order to account for the evidence? And what are the uh, evidence? The evidence uh, is from many, many areas. Uh, you and I have talked about one, the profound, compelling evidence of precognition that we can acquire information from the environment mm -hmm. at a distance from its source and also remotely in time, outside the present moment. Uh, uh, there's that line of evidence. There's also many studies now in remote healing where people through love and compassion and prayer and intentionality can influence the physical, biological function of somebody at a distance. Uh, there are scores of studies looking at that. 
there are so-called presentiment studies that have been done now by researchers all over the world showing a consistent pattern that people can know things before they happen. So the question I confront the students with is this. Look, if this offends you, you can ignore the evidence. But if you want to be a good scientist, you have to honor the evidence and then build a picture of consciousness that account, can account for it. And I tell them the picture that I've come up with, which I believe is adequate, and ask them to do the same thing for themselves. And that's why I stop. Mm -hmm. And almost all of them uh, will come around to the idea that our old way of looking at consciousness, confining it to the brain and the cranium, uh, which is stuck in the present and in the body, just won't do it. And so most of these kids uh, have very little difficulty uh, coming up with what I call a, a non-local view of consciousness, which is just a fancy way of saying that consciousness is infinite mm -hmm. in space and time. And so immortality comes out of this very directly. If something about our mind is infinite in time, it's immortal. It's eternal. So this business of immortality does not necessarily rest on theology or philosophy. It flows directly out of the science. And most of these kids get this. Most of them are thrilled by it. Mm -hmm. Most of these uh, young people have entered science uh, with the notions that you can't bring spirituality in. Uh, all this business of emotionality and the heart have no place in science. It's just coldly objective. And this is the picture they've bought. And most of them are thrilled to see uh, the other heart-connected yeah. factors re-entering science and also the picture of consciousness that's much more consoling and hopeful than the idea that we're all eventually just dead meat. Mm -hmm. And uh, so I have fun doing that. Uh, yeah, uh, I can see and that. It's, it's, it's thrilling uh, to be a part of uh, and young students' lives. Oh, absolutely. And it, it, it rejuvenates not just the students, but me as well. I mean, yeah. that's my juice. Yeah, that's your That's juice. where my juice comes from. What is, what, is, uh, <laughs> what is for you living a juicy life? What, would this, what does this mean? Living a juicy life is telling the truth for me, of trying to follow it wherever it leads and uh, having fun doing it. Uh, also, it means telling the truth, trying to live the truth. That m many years ago, when I would be invited to talk to groups of physicians, I would sanitize my talk and make sure that I didn't step over the line and talk about any taboo subjects. And I finally became disgusted with that approach. It was not fulfilling for me personally. So now I go into uh, the universities and medical schools with the idea that, well, I cannot be fired. I'm not mm -hmm. on the faculty. Mm -hmm. The most they can do is just say, we don't believe this and don't ever come back. And so I began to uh, take a much more courageous, open uh, attitude toward what I would discuss. And it's wonderful. Mm. It, it's juicy. Yeah, yeah. And this <laughs> is why we were born with this infinite, you know, it was a soul with this, because to be courageous enough, I think, to be and live that truth. Well, exactly. And, you know, when you, uh, looking back uh, uh, on decades now, I, uh, I'm quite proud of that approach. I mean, I, I, the last thing I would... Uh, want on my tombstone would be he he was too cowardly to speak up yeah. and I think that uh, we we all have a tendency to hold back sometimes uh, but life is a struggle in truth-telling uh, and so that's what I want to be remembered by mm. he told the truth he told the truth <laughs> <laughs> what would be your recommendation or I should say advice to anybody watching today? Well, I think uh, uh, people ought to realize that uh, we are at a major junction in the uh, directions we choose for our species and our planet. Uh, I happen to believe that time is urgent 
uh, time is not on our side. We need to dance as fast as we can. And uh, I will never forget a conversation I had once with David Bohm, a famous physicist. Uh, this is about 20 years ago. And uh, I asked him, Professor Bohm, do you think we're going to make it as a species? And he thought and he thought and he said, yes, Larry, we'll make it barely. Mm. And uh, I've never forgotten that, and I think he was exactly right. And as urgent as he thought things were 20 years ago, they're even more urgent now. And I think that we're poised as uh, a culture and as a species to make a great leap forward. I think that we're in the process of being birthed into new belief systems that are going to be required if we're going to persist and thrive on this earth. And I think we better get with it. Mm -hmm. We have never had more information with which to make these great transformative transitions than we have now. That's the good part. The hard part is summoning the courage to act and tell the truth and to live out the truth of what we know. Uh, so there's hope, but yet there's a challenge. Mm -hmm. and, and, but the thing is, too, is I, I believe that without coming from fear, without coming from limiting time, but coming from this urgency and this just with all the new elements that we have now, all the new tools, all the new connections mm -hmm. that we have, all this new open door into the infinite, you yeah. know, that we can use uh, to actively participate in this. We cannot do it from the old perception of exactly. life and of operating. I completely agree. The tools that we have at hand for transformative work uh, are simply awesome. The internet has brought uh, a new wild card into the picture. Uh, <laughs> I, I think if we don't make use of these tools, we have no excuse if we go under as a species, as a culture, because it's never been easier. The task may be harder, but the tools are much more profound and effective than they ever have been. And I'm hopeful. Mm -hmm. What are the most powerful tools that you have and that you recommend or that you use? The most powerful tool is consciousness. I happen to believe that consciousness is not confined to the brain. I believe that intentionality gets around. I think we have to be careful about what we think because our thoughts can become uh, uh, actualized in the world through many, many mechanisms. And so consciousness is the most powerful uh, tool that we have at our uh, uh, disposal. But uh, then there are technical tools such as yeah, the internet, practical. the practical tools. Uh, information is almost impossible to hide from these days. Mm -hmm. You have to get under a rock not to know uh, mm -hmm. what the issues are and uh, uh, and so there's that. The, the, the information explosion is absolutely profound but it has a dark side. We can be smothered by it. We can be overcome. Uh, I just finished reading a, a biography of George Washington, our first president, uh, who was a prolific letter writer. And I thought, what could Washington have done with the internet? Mm. Uh, when you look about how those people were able to change the world with the minimal tools at their disposal, mm. uh, not even a good pen, a, a, a quill and ink. Mm. And uh, what were they able to do? Mm. Compare that to what's at our disposal now. Yeah. We have no excuse no. for inactivity and uh, meeting these challenges. Mm. Thank you so much, Larry. It was such a wonderful time <laughs> spending this moment with you. Well, talking with you is very juicy. Thanks. Uh, <laughs> <laughs> thank you so much. If you want to see more interviews, you can check juicylivingtour.com. Much love. <laughs>